Hi all, and welcome to part 3 of this JavaScript tutorial series to recreate the 1976 game Breakout. In this tutorial we're going to create the coloured bricks. But first of all, I've discovered a bug uh, in our touch event, so I'd like to fix that up first. So currently when we move... let me just restart this. Currently when I move the touch cursor, so this cursor here represents a touch of the screen, if I'm moving it, the paddle goes left and right as expected. However, if I stop the touch, what I mean is if I stop moving the touch, can you see that the paddle just continues on moving? Now that's not what we want. We want the paddle to stop where our finger is currently pointing at. So if I move it to here, we want it to stop right under that cursor at the X position. So let's fix that up now. So first of all, we'll need to create a variable. So just under game variables down here, we'll create a variable to keep track of the X location of the touch. So we'll just call that touch X. Uh, just as a note, in my last video I made a mistake in this string here. Touch move must be all lowercase. A capital M there will not work. So make sure you fix that up. So inside our new game, let's initialize touch X. So touch X will equal null. We'll use that to keep track of whether the screen is being touched or not. So just go down to our touch functions. So this touch function here, we'll probably get rid of that and we'll handle touch inside an update function. So I'll just copy the stop uh, move paddle there. So inside our touch cancel, we'd like to set that touch X to equal null. So the user is no longer touching and we'll stop moving the paddle. So we're confident that we can do that. Touch end will behave exactly the same way. So when they stop touching, we'll stop moving the paddle. Touch move, all we'll do is instead of running that method, we'll go touch X will equal all of that, the X location. And we'll do the same thing in our touch start right there. So we're just keeping track of the touch location. So scroll up to our touch function. We no longer want that there. We'll copy this and delete that function. Head down to our update paddle method. So this is move the paddle. Now just above that we want to handle our touch. So handle touch. So if touch x doesn't equal null, then we want to do something here. So we'll paste that code in there. Right, we don't really need that first one because we've already dealt with our stop. So this this one here, if our touch X is greater than the paddle X, then we want to move right. Else if the touch X is less than the paddle X, we could just use an else there, but just bear with me for a second. Less than the paddle X, then we want to move left. Let's try that out. Okay, so I'm holding the, I'm effectively touching the screen and the paddle is following us, which is good. The only problem is that it's got a bit of a jitter, hasn't it? So we'll have to add some sort of buffer because it's trying to get to that exact point, which it can never do. So let's fix that up now. So let's add a buffer. So if the touch X is greater than the paddle X plus say the width of the wall, that's a fairly thin sort of distance, um, then we'll move right. If the touch X is less than the paddle X minus the wall, then we'll move left. And if it's in between, we'll just move paddle stop. Move paddle direction stop. Right, let's give that a go. Yeah, that's much nicer. So the paddle will always follow my finger. If I left my finger on the screen, it will always follow which is great. Perfect, bug fixed. Next, onto our bricks. So head back up to the top. We'd like to set up some uh, new constants for our bricks. So take a look at our picture first. So we have, this is the original game. There are eight rows of bricks. Uh, each two are kind of grouped together into a separate color. And there's some space above the bricks. Now I'm thinking we're going to add some difficulty to our game. So if the player successfully clears all of those bricks, we'll add a new row, well, two new rows, a new color to that. So there'll be eight 
the next level will be 10, 12, and so on. So we'll have to think about how many levels can we possibly get to. So we'll have a maximum level as well. So we'll need some constants for the bricks. So const brick uh, rows, that will equal eight. So that's the starting number of brick rows. We'll also need brick columns. Uh, the original game had 14, so we'll stick with that. It's not the starting number, it's the only number. It never changes, so number of brick columns. We'll need the gap between the bricks. How about we put that as a fraction of, say, wall width? So we'll put, say, 0.3, and that's brick gap as a fraction of wall width. We'll need the margin that's above the bricks. We'll just call that margin. And let's equal, let's say that's equal to the number of empty rows. So we'll say six empty rows. So uh, number of empty rows above the bricks. And we also need the maximum level because that determines how many bricks we need to fit onto our screen. We'll say that's equal to 10. So that'll be the maximum game level. Remembering that every time we go up a level, we have we add two rows of bricks. So plus two rows of bricks per level. That's just what we've defined. That's not in the original game. So let's go down and create some variables. So just under our game variables here, we'll need a bricks array. We can just set that to be equal to an empty array. And we'll need our game level. Uh, because we'll be setting our, the dimensions of our bricks in here, in set dimensions, we should probably put these above where we need them. It's just good coding practice to declare variables before we use them. Uh, set dimensions in there. We create these new paddles and everything. That's effectively a new game. So we may as well call new game there instead. Remembering we're talking about uh, exploiting the resize and that we should start a new game on resize, well, that'll handle that now. Because if you look in new game, we're just setting up that paddle and ball anyway. So while we're there, we may as well set the level to equal zero. And we'll call a function called, say, create bricks to set up our bricks. So back up the top, just make sure that we're not, we are calling new game here again. So we don't need to do that because it's being called within our set dimensions. And let's just create that uh, create bricks function function create bricks. First of all, let's work out our row dimensions. So taking a look at our game, we need to work out the distance between just under that wall there, all the way down to just above our ball. But of course, at maximum level, we don't want bricks flush with the ball. That would be impossible to play. So we'll need some space there. So knowing all of that, let min y equal the wall, so just below the top wall. Let max y equal the ball's y minus half its height, minus ball dot height times 0 0.5, minus some amount of gap. So how about the gap is say one, two, three balls height. So minus ball dot height my, uh, times three. Uh, mathematically speaking, we can combine those, can't we, to equal 3.5. So we'll just get rid of that one there. And now we can work out the total space. So total space, we'll call it total space y, will equal the max y minus the min y. Next, we need to work out the total number of rows. So we'll call that total rows. Let total rows equal, there's the margin, that represents the number of rows above the bricks plus the starting number of brick rows, so brick rows, plus the maximum level, max level. Remembering that each level represents two extra rows, so multiply that by two. Now we can work out the row height. So row H will equal the total space, total space Y divided by the total rows, total rows. We can also work out the gap because it's based off our wall. So let gap equal wall times the brick gap. 
which is we defined as a percentage or as a fraction of wall. And now we can work out the height of a brick. We'll just call that H. So brick height will equal the row height, row height minus the gap. Now we can work out our column dimensions. So taking a look at our game, the total space in the X direction is just between the two walls. So we'll let uh, total space X equal the width of the screen minus the wall times two, right? Uh, we can work out the column width now. So column width will equal the total space X divided by the brick columns. Uh, however, although there are 14 brick columns, there are actually 15 gaps because there's a left and right side, right? So we'll have to subtract away the gap from this total space before we divide it. So that should be okay. Now we can safely work out our brick width, we'll just call that W, and that will equal the column width minus the gap. Now we can populate the bricks array. So populate the bricks array. Uh, we'll probably just want to clear it first. So let's bricks, bricks will equal an empty array. Uh, because we'll be looping over it, let's calculate the rows and columns. So let cols equal the brick cols, that won't change. And let rows equal the brick rows plus level times two, right? So we'll have to think about what are we going to create here? Well, we'll create a brick object, say. Let's, so let's go down and create that now. So right down the bottom, just after where we create our ball, let's create a function called brick. Now what are we going to pass here? Well, we'll know the top, we'll be able to work out the top left-hand corner of the brick. So how about we pass the uh, left and the top. We'll know the width and the height, width and height. And we'll also need the color as well eventually. So let's set those up. So this dot width will equal width. This dot height will equal height. Uh, because we have the left and the top and the width and the height, we can work out the bottom and so on. So this dot bottom will equal the top plus the height. This dot left will equal the left. This dot right will equal the left plus the width, right? And this dot uh, top will equal, let's get rid of that gap. This dot top will equal top. And finally, this dot color will equal color. That looks all good. So let's go up and implement that. Where are we? Here we are. Now let's set up some variables. So we'll need to know the color. And we'll need to know the left and the top. So left, top. We can loop over uh, the bricks array, so let i equal zero. i is less than the rows, i plus plus. We'll need to put uh, set up an array for each of the rows, so bricks i will just equal an empty array. The color, well, we'll just temporarily set it to white. We'll add some, we'll probably add a function here to dynamically set it. And the top, that's based off the row, isn't it? Well, that'll equal the wall, the wall um, width up the top, plus the margin, plus the margin, plus what row we're currently on, which is i, and all of that multiplied by the row height. Now we can loop over the columns. So for let j equal zero, j is less than the cols, j plus plus. We can work out the left-hand side of the brick now. So left will equal the wall plus the gap, the gap before the first brick, plus j times the column width, which we worked out earlier. And finally, we can add the brick. So bricks i j, bricks i j will equal a new brick. We need the left, we have that. We need the top, we also have that. The width, yes, height, yes, and the color. Awesome. 
We'll have to draw the bricks in order to test this, so go up to our loop up here. How about we draw the bricks just before the ball? We'll draw the ball last. So draw bricks, uh, head down to our draw functions, just after we draw the ball here. Function draw bricks. We could just use a let of, sorry, a for of loop here. So we can go for let row of bricks uh, for let brick of row. And then we just have to set the color. So context.fill style will equal the brick.color. And we'll just draw a rectangle, a filled rectangle. So context fill rect. It requires the x and y, which is the top left. So brick dot x, which will be the left. The y will be the brick dot top. And the width will be the brick dot width. And the brick dot height. Good. That should, well, let's try it. Great, that's looking pretty good. The ball will just go straight through it. We haven't set up any collision detection as yet. Uh, next, let's, actually we should probably test the, make sure that when we increase the level, uh, the number of bricks also increases. So down in our new game uh, function, we set the level here. Let's set it to level one. Yep, there's an extra row of bricks and set it to the maximum level. Make sure that it's not going to touch the ball or anything crazy. Yep, so it should have about three, one, two, three balls between it. That's good. And we probably should test uh, what happens when we resize the screen. Yeah, it's resizing okay. Cool. Just change that back to zero. Uh, now head back up to our create uh, brick function here. And we'll need to set some sort of dynamic color here. So how about we create a method called get brick color? We'll have to pass something there, but uh, we'll work that soon. Go down and create that. So just after our draw functions, function get brick color. Now I'm thinking that we'll probably need to pass, if you look at the picture of the game, there's going to be, initially there's going to be four rows. How about we call those ranks? So that red one there will be rank zero, rank one, two, three, and so on, all the way down. Um, knowing that, we'll call that the current, we'll call that rank. And there'll be also the highest rank. We'll work out some sort of fraction. So how about we call that highest rank. And inside here, let fraction equal uh, rank divided by the highest rank. So that is, if we have red, that'll be rank zero. Zero divided by three is zero. Yellow is rank three. Three divided by three is one. And we'll use that fraction to determine this RGB color. So how about we define what those fractions will be? So red will equal zero. What order? I think just to keep it easy for us, we'll go red, orange, yellow, green, because in terms of RGB, that's easier to manage. So red, orange will equal, say, one third, 0.33. Yellow will equal 0.67. And finally, green will equal one. So just in here, we'll have to set up our R, G, and B. So R, G, B, that's, they're our color components. Uh, knowing my colors, I know that red, orange, yellow, and green, there is no blue in any of them, so that blue equals zero. And what we'll want to return here is the color string, the RGB color string. So in JavaScript and CSS and so on, you can prefix it with RGB bracket plus the R component plus a comma and a space plus the G component plus the comma and a space and finally add the B component plus the closing bracket. So now let's work out the individual color components. So the first one we'll work out is the red to orange to yellow. They're all related to one another. They all have maximum red color. And as we increase the green, so increase green, they'll change shade 
to slowly turn into yellow. So if the fraction is less than or equal to 0.67 here, 0 0.67, then the red, the red will always be 255. It'll be maximum for these colors. The green will start at zero and work its way up to 255. So we'll say 255 times the fraction divided by 0 0.67. So if zero comes in, zero divided by 0 0.67 is zero, we'll have no green, meaning that we'll have a red color. If 0.67 comes in, 0.67 divided by 0.67 is one, so we'll have 255 green here. So R255, G255 is yellow, and everything in between will be a shade of orange. Next, we have to work out the green component. So this will be yellow to green. In order to, so currently we have R255, G255 at this stage. So in order to get green, we just have to reduce the red, reduce red. So else, for everything above 0.67, the R component will start at 255, multiplied by one minus the fraction. And all of that divided by the difference between one and 0.67, which will be 0 0.33. So if 0.67 comes in here, well, just over 0.67, one minus 0 0.67 will equal 0 0.33, divided by 0 0.33 is one, so we'll have maximum red and therefore the yellow color. If, if one comes in here, that's the maximum this refraction could be. One minus one is zero, divide by anything is zero. Two five five times that is zero. So R will be minimized, meaning we'll be left with a green color. And throughout the entire process here, G will be two five five. We'll just put a note down here. Uh, this will be return the RGB color string. Right, so that get brick color is okay. Let's go back up to where we use it. And we need to pass in the parameters. So we need a rank. We need a rank and a highest rank. So rank, we'll just call that rank high. Let's create those variables just up here. So rank and rank high. Rank high we can work out immediately. So rank high will equal, we'll take a look at our picture here. There's one, two, three, four ranks starting at zero. So rank zero, one, two, three, and there's eight rows. So we'll have to divide it by two and subtract one. So that'll be rows times 0 0.5 minus one. So we have eight rows times 0 0.5 is four, four minus one is three, zero, one, two, and three. That's correct. Now the rank itself will just equal half of I, won't it? Round it down. So we'll go math.floor, math.floor i times 0 0.5. So for 0 and 1, for i equals 0 and 1, 0 times that, 1 times that, rounded down will both be 0. For 6 and 7, they'll be our highest two numbers. 6 times 0.5 is 3, 7 times 0.5 is 3.5, rounded down is 3. So they'll be both at maximum rank of 3 and hopefully return a green color. Let's give that a go. Ah, that's looking nice. So, so far so good. The ball won't do anything as yet. It'll just pass over it, but it's looking nice, the colors. Let's try to increase the level down in our new game function. Just add one, so we'll start level one. We should, ex we expect a second, sorry, a fifth row. Let's give that a go. Yep, and the colors, can you see they're slowly progressing from red through to green? Let's try level three. Looking nice. And maximum level 10. Awesome. So we're slowly progressing from green through to green, yellow, yellow, orange, and red. Great. Just put that back to zero. Next, we'll have to update our bricks. So up in our loop function, just up here, underneath where we update the ball, let's make a method called update bricks, passes the time delta. Uh, let's create that just underneath where we update the ball. Function update bricks, pass the delta. And what will we do inside? We'll check for 
all collisions. So we'll have to loop over the bricks array. So for let i equal zero, i is less than the bricks dot length, i plus plus. Uh, the columns for let j equal zero, j is less than the brick dot columns, which is a fixed number, j plus plus. So what will we do when the ball strikes the brick? I'm thinking that we could just set it to null, so we'll have to test for that here. So if bricks i j doesn't equal null, and bricks i j uh, intersects with the ball. How about we create an, a helper method later, intersect ball. We'll put that on the uh, brick object soon. So if it intersects with the ball and it's not null, then we can safely set it to null. So bricks i j will equal null. We'll also want to change the direction of the ball. So ball.yv will equal minus ball.yv. We'll also want to set up some scoring and so on, so we'll put a to-do here. We'll do that in the next video. To-do, score, etc. And finally, if we hit a brick, we don't want to continue cycling through all of this, so we'll need to break. Uh, we'll have to use a tag, sorry, a label here. We'll call it outer, and we'll label the outer loop outer, just so that it breaks both these loops. Because we're setting our bricks to null here, we'll have to test for that inside our draw bricks function. So head up to draw bricks, draw bricks inside here. If brick equals null, then we just want to continue. That means we'll skip over this remaining code and go to the next iteration. Because if that brick was null, this will break, won't it? Okay, and the last thing that we need to do is set up that intersect function inside our brick object. So go down to our brick object. So this dot intersect will equal a new function. It will take ball as a parameter. Uh, the ball doesn't have left and right and so on, so we can just work it out here. Let b bottom, b bot, equal the ball's y position plus half its height, so ball dot height times 0 0.5. We'll have to do that for each of the sides, so ball bottom, ball left, ball right, and ball top. So ball top will be similar, but it will be minus half the ball's height. Ball left and right will be both based off the x coordinate and the width. So left will be the ball x minus half the ball width, and ball right will be the ball x plus half the ball width. That should be okay. So what will we need to return here? We'll need to return whether the ball rectangle overlaps this rectangle. So return this dot left is less than the ball's right, and uh, the ball's left is less than this dot right, and the this dot bottom is greater than the ball's top, and the ball's bottom is greater than this dot top. I think that should be okay. Let's try it out. To restart that. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. It seems to be working okay. Anyway, I'll have a play with this and I'll come back to you soon. Everything seems to be running okay. There's only one slight issue that I've found, and it occurs when the ball is quite fast and the paddle is very thin. So in this sort of situation where the screen width is very thin, they'll see the ball is quite fast, and occasionally, as you just saw there, the ball passes straight through the paddle. That's because the frame rate, at one frame the ball is above the paddle, and at the next frame the ball is below, and it's not detecting the collision. So we can alleviate that somewhat. Go into the update ball function, just where we're bouncing off the paddle. Currently we're just checking for this, ball y is less than the paddle y, 
So that means the center of the ball has to be less than, has to be above the center of the paddle. Well, we could alleviate the issue a little bit just by adding this on. So we'll consider the full thickness of the paddle. And that should play fine. I'll just give it a go on this little thin screen first. Yeah, it's bouncing off it okay. It's not, it doesn't seem to be going through. Not that anybody would be playing on such a thin screen, right? And just make sure that it's working at the full normal size. Yeah, it's fine. And it can miss the paddle okay. Yep. So that's it. So that'll do us for this uh, tutorial. In the next tutorial, we're going to add some difficulty to the game. So increase the level. And we'll also add the score and lives and so on. So until next time, talk to you then. Bye.